Hi, and thanks for joining us for uh, I Wonder Who, an occasional series of um, interviews with the people behind and, and sometimes the people within the great documentaries we have on I Wonder. Um, th this time I'm going to be talking to the uh, co-directors uh, Matthew and Barnaby O'Connor of, of our film The Pickup Game uh, about the seedy underbelly of a very nefarious industry. We'll show you a trailer in a second. And also uh, Minnie Lane, who is a dating and self-development coach from the UK, who's um, the emotional core of the film in some ways, but featured throughout. Um, so let's have a look at the trailer and then we'll um, go and chat to the guys. Today, I'm gonna teach you, talk about, and I'm gonna share some experiences with you about everything you need to know about talking to girls. I understand that the idea that there's a system, when it comes to meeting women and attracting women, that can completely get a girl anytime, it's a scary thing. And not only that, society look at it in a bad way, but guess what? We're not the mainstream, nor do we care to be the mainstream. I mean, the less people that know about it, the better it is, right? It still really surprises me how many people have absolutely no idea that this industry even exists. Whose first free tour is this ever? Hands up. Oh my God! We're talking about a multi-million dollar global industry. I don't know how it's managed to stay so underground. A lot of men hire someone like us to put their life in our hands. This lifestyle is sold as and seems like the dream to a lot of students that come on these courses. But I think there is this dark side of the industry. There really is. Ultimately, it works for people who are willing to assume that lifestyle. The problem is it's a very sociopathic thing to do. Isn't it? I don't think that a lot of people understand that there is this real subculture and what their teachings are and what the beliefs are. What we have today is an absolute treat. We're gonna show you hidden camera footage where Justin picks up women from the streets of New York, makes them his girlfriends, gets them to tattoo his name to show their devoted love, and then finally reveals they were on camera all along. And believe it or not, they all stick around afterwards. You're your baby. You know you're crazy, right? No. 911. Hi. Um. I'm calling to my friend. I can't hear you. Your friend? What? And uh, just to introduce the I Wonder element of this, I'm James Bridges, the co-founder of I Wonder, and I'm joined by also um, Alexandra Fox Hughes, who is our head of content. Um, Matthew Barnaby, Mini, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Hello. Um, I guess the first and most obvious question, and it'll be a different answer for for each of the three of you, is uh, what brought you to this subject matter? Because it's um, a little dark, and uh, it obviously had a real moment of international fame with the book, The Game, um, about 15 years ago. But what led you to look at it again uh, later on? I'll start with the directors. OK, maybe I should go first on that. Um, so I think the things we were always aware of, um, I, had, I had read The Game when it was released, and I'd always been aware of it as a, a subculture and as, a, as an industry. Um, and what happened was I was doing a, a music video and one of the people that was in it was uh, telling me about how she was a conversation girl for one of these pickup companies. And basically there's, with a lot of the pickup, um, as you kind of see in the documentary, there's, there's sort of two elements to the, the pickup seminars. There's the daytime element where they, um, they, they kind of sit people in a, in a room or a classroom and they, 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 they do a kind of theory. And then there's the, there's the practical element where they actually kind of take them outside and they take them to cafes or bars or nightclubs. And, and, and that's the sort of the application side of things. Um, and this, this girl was explaining that she was a conversation girl. So she was working in for a pickup company during the day. Um, they would, teach the students, they would, they would give them sort of conversation tips and, and how to start a conversation, how to keep one going. And then the students would come up to her and they would practice these conversation tips on her and she would, she would give them feedback. Um, and I just thought that that was such a fascinating 
I did. I did. It's the first time I kind of really encountered it in 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 the flesh. And so we we did an interview with her, which was again kind of unearthed all kinds of things, and that was really the beginning of trying to get into the the subject matter and trying to get into the the, the subculture and the industry. One of the uh, the kind of things that we quickly learn is just how complicated and uh, different this industry is because. From the surface, the conversations that we had with uh, with the lady, you kind of disbelieve just how deep that rabbit hole goes. And sort of the more that we looked into the industry, the more interested um, we became and we felt, okay, this is actually a story that we have to kind of unearth um, and bring to the public. Great. And Minnie, you um, are no longer part of that industry, but obviously you started with a, a unique perspective. Yeah, well, I really wanted to be involved in this documentary because um, because of the journey that I had with this industry. So I've, I've actually got quite a lot of empathy for the people that get sucked into it because I joined um, as a conversation coach, much like the girl that um, Matthew met. And when I entered the industry, I actually really thought there was quite a lot of good there. And I still think there is some good there. And that's why it can be so confusing. Um, but it was only after I'd been there for a month or two that I really started to see this other side to it. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd love to touch on that. The trailer probably accentuates the negative and that, the, you know, there's uh, it, it, to the degree that there is any black and white and right and wrong in this, there are some people who are clearly, you know, pretty um, negative uh, players in this industry for, you know, lack of a better word. Um, but there is a human need that this is getting at and 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 some of the um students uh, that you talk to there's one guy andrew who's particularly reflective about it while shy and not sure about being on camera um and wanting that human contact i guess i get wanted to talk about where, where do you see that line and i'll ask um, you to start with me but to all of you guys um where do you see that line of sort of it's a good thing it's a good thing okay then it becomes a negative thing well, yeah, I mean, this is what used to be very blurry for me and, and, and now it's absolutely black and white. And, and the difference is it depends whether someone's actions are rooted in wanting to get something and take something from, from the person they're talking to or if they're um, giving, if you like, or just having an interaction and, and they're open to anything that comes up. I think the difference is when the actions, when the, the motivation behind the actions is to push an agenda and particularly when it's an agenda that they're deceiving the, the other person with so it's a hidden agenda and then it's it's dressed as as something completely opposite of that it's, it's dressed as if this is a surprise encounter that's that's new and different you, know, you see in the film none of these girls are being treated as if they're the hundredth girl that's been approached they approach each one as if this person has really stuck out to them and they've, they've noticed something special about mm. this person and it's this whirlwind romance and then she gets swept up in that and it's not true it's not true at yeah. all. Um, Minnie, if I can sort of jump in at that, I think a really interesting part for me in the film is when you say, um, you know, actually the game itself, it works on girls with insecurities. And, you know, and I think if you and sort of look at that and then you look at the guys who are going on these courses and, you know, they're paying for something because of their insecurities. Mm -hmm. So each, you know, each sort of, component of of this sort of chat up or pick up is really um you know being something or being told to be something they're not so then if we look at that you know can we say that then it's really the the gurus the self-professed gurus the pickup artists that are actually you know really manipulative of, of the other two points of the triangle um and are pretty predatory in that sense for their Plain own agenda everyone. Plain yeah, everyone. I think it does become that. I mean, there's there's a reason why these people get to the tops. It's much in the same way as you see if you if you look at banks, the people that get to the top of banks are the psychopaths, um, mm -hmm. because they're the ones that are willing to tread on everybody else to get to that place. And the, the people who end up top of this industry are the ones who are very very good salesmen. And yeah. that's why the whole thing works because they're so good at manipulating that that they can sell anything. They can sell their courses. They can sell themselves to women. They can and and then then they are. Um, they're getting these egoic highs of like money, fame, and all, all this attention from women and from the students. And it's it's a very, very 
dangerous place to get to and a, a place that can be quite hard for them to get out of. You know, I actually have some empathy for them getting stuck in those places because I see how it happens. Absolutely. I think, you know, by the end of, uh, you know, the, the film itself and the elements that we touch on throughout uh, really take you on a bit of a sort of empathy and sympathy roller coaster, you know, like for, for everybody. And um, certainly at the end, you know, or we meet some of the, the OGs, like the, the older guys from um, who started off, you know, the game Rock with the and, Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, they can look back and say, you know, it's it's not something that has I've got any validation from, you know, now. Um, and I'm looking at these younger guys who are just into the cosmetics, um, and it left me wondering, you know, if we were to be sympathetic to to the younger guys who are the pickup game artists now, you know, are they victims of? A sort of a, this digital age, you know, looking for validation um, from social media online, you know, following like men following them, um, you know, what, what would what would you say to that? I think I think everybody involved in it is a victim in some way, and actually, mm -hmm. in the larger scale, we are all victims of um, this world that has our value system in the wrong place because we don't understand the difference between ego and and true self, mm -hmm. and um, you know, one of the the dangerous things about not just this, but lots of industries and lots of ways in which people go the wrong way is that it seems like it's the answer. These these men genuinely think that they've joined this and they've found out these things and they've now got the answer. They've, they've resolved their problems. And of course they haven't because all they've done is try to not face their insecurities by controlling other people so that they get a good response rather than the negative response that would highlight their insecurities. And, you know, that's actually coming from a place of fear. That's coming from a need to control others, to get them to respond to you in a certain way mm -hmm. is coming from a place of insecurity. And whenever you act from a place of insecurity, you're actually making your insecurity worse when that gets rewarded. Mm -hmm. So this becomes a, a slippery slope, a, a sort of downward spiral. Um, and they're not even aware that they're on a downward spiral. They actually feel like they're on an upward spiral because mm -hmm. they're getting egoic highs and they don't understand the difference between um, a high that's because you're masking your own insecurity again and a high because you've actually resolved your issue because they can feel similar. I mean, to create a documentary of, say, an hour and a half is very difficult when you have so much content um, to go through. One of the points <clears throat> that we were, or that we kind of broached in the documentary is this kind of sense of lack of male role models in this day and age. Mm -hmm. and what generally kind of what we've seen is that, you know, a lot of the students turn to the internet for help and guidance. And that's kind of where that trap starts because they believe that these companies will help them, um, you know, become better, uh, become more confident. And that's also one of the first kind of steps into the industry of, okay, I'm looking for somebody to help me these guys seem to, to, to have a good handle on things and then they start down that road. Um, I, as I understand it, quite a lot of the film was the interviews and a lot of the, the film that was shot before the, you know, the Harvey Weinstein moment really blew up. How would you say, if, if you know and if you think it has, how would you say the industry has changed, if at all, in the wake of this, because I mean, it, it, you know, if if it, if it was an underbelly and unacceptable before, it has to be pretty, you know, widely uh, reviled now. What these guys are doing, at least overtly. I think I think one of the biggest things that, that has happened. YouTube is a massive uh, sort of source, is a massive funnel for people coming to these companies and finding out about this kind of thing. Um, one of the things that has happened is. A lot of the content or the type of content that is being put on YouTube is very, very toned down now compared to how it was before Me Too. Simply, and I think the main reason for that is that YouTube has started deplatforming and demonetizing videos that they think are too um, too controversial. So if people will complain, we're now at a stage where YouTube would just they they just won't allow that content to be up there any longer. Mm. So what you found is a lot of the pickup companies are now repackaging or rebranding themselves, at least publicly. Now, whether or not they've actually changed, 
from uh, in terms of behind the scenes. I mean, that's something that's a whole that's a whole separate conversation. But it's moved much more as far as the um, for the majority of them, they've moved to a kind of lifestyle life improvement. Um, Five kind of, <laughs> I beg your the fire Instagram is the next of this. Yeah. 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 That makes it even harder now to spot the difference. It's like this yeah. this this pressure has been a good thing. The pressure of Me Too and of documentaries like this is that there there is a very real pressure on the industry, and there's no way that anybody in in the industry doesn't feel that. People have been ripping down YouTube videos and rebranding their websites, and that's a really good thing that there that there is this pressure. Um, but you know, it, it is much harder to tell from the outside, and a lot of these people are changing their branding without actually having changed what they're teaching is underneath. Um, mm -hmm. And so, in some ways, it, it might have made things worse. It, well, I, temporarily at least. I, I I think also a lot of a lot of actually I don't know how, but there are def there's definitely people in the pickup um, subculture that just dismiss me too. You know, they mm. don't. They don't take it seriously. They don't. They think it's an overreact. You know, they and 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 it's almost like, oh, don't go all me too on us. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of they they, yeah. they they just they're not even willing to look at the behavior, um, because they're very indoctrinated into the 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 types of things that that come up in the documentary. You know, women don't mean what they say. Mm -hmm. They say they want one thing. They want something else. I mean, when you when you if if you have that attitude, not that you know then 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 obviously you can just rationalize it however you want um because yeah i think that's a really disturbing you know from from you know me just watching it personally a disturbing piece like takeaway from the documentary um is yeah just the amount of these guys who kind of you know tell themselves or sell themselves this belief system that you know women are really um you know they're not who they say they are it doesn't matter there's a terrible clip about um one of the pickup artists in reference to asian women um who you know are, are like pet dogs um and there's just that you know there's a real lack of respect um and i think because it suits their narrative probably and and one of those characters that we meet is um uh, Justin Wayne, who I just found so hard to watch. And it, it made me think, and going back to the YouTube um, conversation, you know, how did you manage to get hold of a lot of this footage and the secret camera footage? Like, is or was that all sort of freely available on the likes of YouTube? Was that in their marketing material? Or were you able to have you know conversations with some of the pickup artists who were actually quite happy to share it because they're actually pretty proud of it, um, you know? And I'm, I'm really thinking of one of Justin Wayne's clips, uh, which is really upsetting um, when he's sort of lured two girls to his apartment in New York and they're you know a bit confused and um, trying to get out of it but um, not really finding a, a way to do that. Um, you know how how. How do you manage to source that kind of content? Because it's it's fascinating but disturbing at the same time. Um, most of the content is free or was freely available on YouTube, and because of this sort of mentality of almost bragging about conquest yeah. and you know who is the best pickup artist out there, who has the best system, um, a lot of the content that is on the in the documentary was freely available on YouTube. Um, and then, of course, uh, a lot of the pickup artists gave us back catalogs or um, access to, to, to their kind of, should we say, private videos um, that they showed to the students. I mean, I think that's kind of one good thing, to, well, not a good thing, one thing to, to bear in mind is that <clears throat> you have the promotional material that is available to, to the public. When you actually attend the seminar and the doors close, they take your cell phone, they pad you down wow. um, to ensure that nobody is recording or capturing any of the information that you see in that seminar. And so effectively they're free to show you whatever, whatever they want with, uh, you know, which can be quite sort of, uh, should we say disgusting footage. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, you know, just this, it's tough to tough to watch. And, um, you know, actually, incidentally, I've been on the tail end of some of that pickup chat, you know, in London a couple of times, um, you know, I've had guys come up. I, 
you know, in a sort of more innocent sense on the on the street, you know, practicing like, oh, hey, I like your jacket. And then walking off and, you know, and you sort of like, yeah, yeah, all right, I know, I know what's happening here, um, which was quite lucky. But yeah, you, you start to see the, you know, the funnel, the rabbit hole that can go go down. And it's, it's, it's really, you know, scary from that perspective. And, um, and, and in that sense, one of the best, you know, quotes, and I think we see it in the trailer is, it's a film every woman needs to see for that perspective. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased that we, we can, you know, give it a platform. Um, Can I just? To, add, sorry, go on. I was just going to say. To be honest, um, the, it took about four years, or over four years, to make the documentary, and we were subjected to this material constantly, day in day yeah. out. And and you know, it is actually quite hard to stomach after a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, which makes it quite difficult to, um, yeah, to, to to edit every day. I think also there's there's a difficult thing with documentary where, um, and this is this is a this is particular to this film where you know you you're interviewing someone you're spending time with them, you realize that the material that you're getting is very compelling, and then at the same time you realize that perhaps it doesn't make them look particularly good, and that's a very that's actually a, from a personal point of view that's a very difficult line to walk because I don't I never really wanted to. Ex make people out to look you know uh, it, it's not really about shaming people or, or or attacking people i mean i think that's too easy and i i, I really mm -hmm. hope that there is an element of compassion with this film and how we've done it but just to go back to what you're saying about justin there was a time i sat down with justin and he'd given us some material the the tattoo incident which is in the film yeah um, and i said to him listen you know i i will put this in the documentary but i need you to understand people are going to go crazy when they see this. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go down very well. I just want you to understand that because I don't want you to come to me and feel like I took a bar or I lured you in or, or whatever. And and he his attitude was, okay, you know, it's mm -hmm. not about being liked. It's not about popularity. It's, it's, there's a, there's a, there's a thing of, um, I, of wanting to prove that you are the best and the, the tattoo incident without kind of, without sort of, wow spoiling it is 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 his way of proving that right if, if, if that makes sense um, no. and, and that's maybe the worst lesson in all of this is it, it does work right you know and that's that's the, the one of the hard things you guys must have had to have done which is the same issue with the game do you are you enabling and popularizing or are you shining a light on it um and in fact, one, one of the things we try to talk about in these things is, is the story since. And, and I'd love to know, you know, for instance, have you spoken to any of the guys from it? And Minnie, I'll come and I want to talk about your having been in the industry in a second uh, and, and whether you've sort of connected with any of those people since the film. But Matthew and Barnaby, first of all, any recent chats or more, more recent chats with the film with maybe the pickup artists or Ross Jeffries? How did they feel about their, you know, their portrayal? So Justin actually contacted me shortly before the release of the film, uh, and he was saying, you know, how have you played it? Because Vice, Vice had done a segment on him, and they'd make it look they 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 had sort of made it look like he was paying women to to be his girlfriend, and and there was a whole sort of internet thing with that. And I I think he was asking, you know, are you going to say that I'm? Are you going to make out that I'm I'm legit or not? You know, how how are you kind of framing that whole? Um, Paul Janka uh, has seen the film. He's um, he's one of the the the, the people in it. Um, I, I mean, he was very positive, you know. But he's he's kind of moved on now, and 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 he he says we discussed the, you know some of the darker sides that we explored in the film, and he said I think that needed to be done. I think those are things that need to be raised. Um, as far as Ross, I, I we haven't heard from Ross. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, Ross is a Ross is not a fan of the media at the best of times. So. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a slight, um, a slight legal battle with one of the companies featured in the documentary, um, where they tried to um, to pull the documentary from one of the uh, one of the festivals that it was in, uh, but uh, the legal team has. Quashed that battle. So, mm. Um, mm. Yeah. 
Well, I think, you know, we can see that um, there's certainly, there is, it's a global industry and it's, a, you know, there has been global backlash to what they're doing. Um, you know, we see in the film seminars in London, like Tokyo, LA, um, and then it all seems to come to a climax um, in Melbourne. Uh, and, you know, when even, you know, the Australian government steps in and sort of bans one of the gurus, um, Julian, um, from the country, uh, which is an extreme measure to take. And, you know, and I think we see some sort of clip of, you know, actually how extreme some of the protests are outside these seminars. I mean, can you guys, you know, talk to, um, you know, what, what you've, what kind of feedback you've had from, you know, around the world and, and Australia and, you know, perhaps why, you know, people are, are so up in arms in it. And, and this was before me too. Mini, why don't you um, yeah, take that off? Yeah, I was just, I think it's a really interesting point um, because there's, you know, the, the Take Down Julian Blanc scandal is, is a perfect example of how it's impossible to expose this industry or anything about it without popularizing it. And mm -hmm. um, you know, that one of the criticisms of, of the documentary, I mean, most of, the, most of the feedback is very positive, but there have been a few criticisms about um, it's sort of giving a, a platform and uh, sort of advertising these pickup companies. Um, and it's really interesting to to know that also the take down Julian's Blanc scandal did the same thing. You know, actually, mm -hmm. the, the the attempt to take it down still exposed it, and it did popularise it because the, the problem is that there are there are so many people that need help with dating and they don't know where else to get it. Um, so even if they think, even if they if if it's exposed as being something that's not a good thing. Um, you know, try telling that to a 40 year old man that's never even so much as held hands with a woman. If you say to him, OK, you know, if, if you do this, then you'll be able to have um, one night stands and stuff with women and, and they'll find you attractive. But you shouldn't do that because it's a bad thing. He's mm -hmm. not going to. <laughs> it's and yeah. it, this whole process. Then, you know, you be yourself. He says, I've been trying to be myself for 40 years and that doesn't work. You know? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I work, I have lots of people come to me and they, they want these quick fix, uh, this quick fix help of, of how to get women and how to get these things from women. And, you know, I, I, I spend time with these people and I explain the difference and I explain that the whole journey and why everything's happening. And, and once they understand it, they never want to do pickup anymore. Never. It's just that they don't realize there's an alternative and there is, and it's not such a quick fix. Um, which is why it's not so popular, but it it isn't going to make your life worse. And I think that the really good thing about this documentary is that it shows the whole picture. You know, it, it shows the whole story that, yes, at first you are going to think that you've found the solution to your problems. But look at Ross Jeffries now. Is that really what you want? Is it? Is, is that what you're signing up to this for? No offense to Ross Jeffries. Maybe I, I feel like he's probably much happier now than he was back then. Um, but you know that's that's the whole story of where it's heading. So if yeah. that's what you want, great, go for it. But yeah. for most people, that's not what they want. They want to deep down, they want real connection with women, not to have to pretend to be something that they're not in order to in order to have a fake connection with a woman. But they just don't realise that there's a, there's the option to have a, a real connection with somebody if they do if they do some real self development work instead. You say, look at Ross Jeffries now, and we get the opportunity to do that in the film. And and I think, um, you know, one of the great moments, I, 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 I hand it to you, Barnaby and Matthew, for being very unjudgmental throughout the film. I mean, there, as I say, there are some obvious black and white areas, and then there's some, you know, the rest of it as, as life is, is really gray. But there's a wonderful moment or early in the film where you see from an interview of Ross Jeffries puffing his chest up and talking about how he can get any woman into bed um, uh, in a 1980s daytime talk show and a woman just shakes her head and says you're going to end up a very lonely man and of course without spoiling it at the end we do get to sit down with Ross Jeffries. What was it like um, going into that and, and, and I suppose you know uh, I suppose we would want people to who's trying to see this film beforehand so I'm not too worried about spoilers if you guys aren't but just to, can you talk about setting that meeting up and, and, and was he eager to dust off the old chops and talk again or did he feel you know like um, he knew that this was not going to go well because it, it ultimately hadn't. 
Barnaby, yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say that, that Matt can answer this question, but um, we, we were very fortunate when we first contacted Ross Jeffries because he was actually coming to London for his last ever pickup seminar. Um, and we had to, 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 to meet him from the airport, wine him and dine him, um, have a long conversation about what exactly it was that we were putting together in the documentary, the types of questions that we had to ask. And um, it was initially quite a difficult um, first meeting, but when we turned up for, for the actual interview, um, it was actually uh, it was actually quite a good um, conversation that we ended up having with him. We, we we actually interviewed him twice. So we interviewed him once in 2014, and that was and that was really what started off the the. Um, there's there's two interviews with him in the film, and that's really what started the ball rolling for the documentary itself. Because once we'd interviewed him, a lot of the other pickup instructors, you can go to them and say, look, we're doing a documentary on pickup. We've interviewed Ross Jeffries. And because everybody in the pickup world knows who Ross Jeffries is, um, it, it was a lot easier to get people to sort of speak to us. The, the bit at the end of the film was the second interview that we did with him, which was um, actually two and a half years later, we'd, we'd done the documentary, we'd, we'd edited it, and we thought, you know, we need to speak to him again to get him to clear up some there's, a, there's, there's, there's some questions that he needed to answer. And so we went and interviewed him. And then the, the actual ending of the film, I mean, can I explain what it is? Or I'm not sure what the... Yeah, I think, I mean, I think okay. so. We, you know, okay, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't okay. seen it. Go and yeah. watch the film now, but um, yeah. yeah. So, so the actual ending of the film, so we, I, we, we went, we sat down with the interview, and then he said, oh, would you, would you please film my cats? <laughs> you know, I, would you film me with the cats and would you please include them in the documentary? which I thought was, I don't know, like a very strange request, to be honest. I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't that stuff that you see then, it wasn't planned. I, I, a lot of it's, it's incredible how even, even Andrew, who's the student we showed a little bit earlier on, um, who is, you know, there's, that was unplanned. I just, we were filming other stuff and he just came up to us and said, look, do you want, do you want to film me for a bit? I'm out here on the street um, trying to practice pickup. I, and and like that and like the cats thing it wasn't i mean you couldn't you couldn't plan for that stuff and it's some of the most compelling stuff in the film um and i, I yeah so it wasn't it wasn't deliberate it wasn't orchestrated but i think it just says a lot about the the potential pitfalls of this lifestyle you yeah. know um and I, I guess uh, sorry Oh, sorry, no, I think he. I think he wanted that to be in there as a warning as well, and and I think it's it's important to notice that he he doesn't say, "I wish I was back in my glory days." Mm. He says, mm -hmm. "I wish I knew then what I know now." Yeah. And, and if anyone takes anything away from the film, it should be that that look at somebody who's gone the whole journey and listen to the advice they're giving you now, now that they understand. And and. It, you know, I, I imagine he's way happier now than he was back then because now he, he's discovered real love because cats won't let you use them. You know, yeah. through, through cats, he has learned how to give and how to share and how to have a real relationship. And the relationship he has with his cats is actually more loving and genuine than any of the relationships he ever had with women. And yeah. you know, maybe that's sad or maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe that's just, that was his journey in life. But... You know, he, he has discovered now what really matters in a roundabout way. And he's saying to people, that didn't matter. I'd got it wrong then. And and now I understand. And in a way, and now it's too late. But, you know, maybe he's happy. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, taking, I, love it. I was just going to say, taking Andrew, the student, setting out on the journey and taking Ross Jeffries, the ultimate end to the journey, what um, advice do you give Andrew to say, don't, you know, this is what it could become, but here's, here's how you do it differently entirely or slightly differently because, you know, he was, he was, there was a moment where he, the, the student was looking like he was beginning to gain some confidence and, and that was giving him some sort of strength. You know, the, the, the confidence has to be a good end to some degree in this for people who lack it. I think Andrew's pretty wise, actually. I don't think he was swept up in it all. He, he at the end, he points out, I look at some of these instructors and they're empty. 
and and he he really sees it for what it is actually and i think he's one of the students that some, you know some people come on these courses and they do well from it because they they do see it for what it is and they they gain the confidence to go out you know he's he's going out chatting to a few people um he's quite polite to people um, I don't, I mean, I think that the most he's ever going to be to any woman is, is a, a slight annoyance. I think if anyone said to him, can you leave me alone, please? I think he would. Mm -hmm. um, and he's learning the value of connection. And he says in the film, you know, this is what life is about. It's about meeting a woman and having that real connection. And I, I think if if pickup can can be used as literally just a sort of opener to, to create an interaction, it's not so bad. I mean, I, it's still... I still only ever teach honesty, but I, I don't really think there's anything that wrong in making up an excuse to speak to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my my dad met my mum that way. He he right. had through a friend and he really liked her and he accidentally on purpose bumped into her outside the place she was graduating because he'd found out where she was graduating. And he wasn't honest about that. He was like, oh, what a coincidence to bump into mm -hmm. you. Um, of course, afterwards he told her, but I don't think anyone would think that was a bad thing in fact it's quite romantic but that's yeah. because his intentions were good his intentions were to treat her well her intentions were his intentions were to have a relationship with her and not to try and take her and just take things from her and deceive her um into giving thing what he wanted giving him what he wanted so i, I think so much of it is, is about intention and and when somebody manages to not get swept on this egoic path and and they, and they stick true to it. No, I came here because I, I want to learn how to have relationships with women. I think there, there's only so wrong it goes, but unfortunately there are lots of people that aren't coming from that place and they've got a lot of anger towards women. They want to take women down. There's, there's a, a sense of women have had all the power and now they want it. There's fear in them, which is making them want to control and manipulate and not take any risks. And yeah, that's when it goes in a, in a horrible direction. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the misunderstanding from both both sides, uh, you know, is is overpowering in some ways The women are expecting something nefarious to approach and the men and, and actually they're just slightly unconfident men who are just trying to think of the right thing to say. And the men, as you say, you know, in the worst case, they're assuming that the women have all the power and they're abusing that when they're just looking for a nice person to, to come and talk to them, you know, and, and, and if we we break through that uh, in some way and I guess that's what your coaching tries to do um, we can we can come to a better understanding I think I think we all agree that actually you know there's nothing wrong with teaching whether it's a guy or girl confidence to you know approach somebody to start having a chat and having a meaningful conversation and that's actually a really wonderful thing that like nobody should feel you know they can't do that or you know they're alone because they don't have those skills or the skill set and you know it, it's just a case of yeah finding a way that their as you say many their intention is corrected if it was on the wrong path before and um you know many are you finding through you know the teaching that you do that actually you know to leave us on a happy note that they are um you know lots of men you know are receptive to that you know they do want um you know a more meaningful relationship and it's you know it's things like the pickup um pickup sort of industry that uh sort of take it off on a on a slightly dark and sinister tangent absolutely i i maybe i'm a bit of a blind optimist but i i really believe that underneath everything we all want real connection and we only settle for for second best because we don't mm. think the first best is is an option um you know i use the example if, if i say to to new clients you know if i could give you a magic cloak that you could put on and all women would find you attractive is that what you really want lots of them would say yeah that's exactly what i want please can you give me that i will pay good money for it mm -hmm. and and then i ask them okay well if you had the option between that magic cloak or women liking you and being attracted to you without the magic cloak which would which would you have mm -hmm. And always they would prefer the second, but they're they're willing to just completely discount that and say, no, what I want is a magic cloak I can put on. And and that is really what pickup does. It, it gives you this magic cloak that that will make women respond to you in a certain way. But it's not you that they're responding to. It's the magic cloak. And you know that 
so you can never have a real connection you can never feel secure in that relationship and that's why um these pickup artists have a lot have a high turnover of women and it can be problematic when they actually fall for somebody because there's only so long you can keep it up and and because they they still are insecure on the inside about who they really are um they can only have these short-term relationships because there's this ticking time bomb that where they know that once the real them comes out that person might not like them Right. I mean, it, and it strikes me as well that on this in this pursuit for companionship, um, you know, actually the validation, the sort of the twist. Um, and I think we kind of see this come through in, in, you know, the documentary as well is, you know, the twist is that actually at some stage, the validation is no longer sought from women so much. It's more sought from the men, the brotherhood around you. Um, and that's a really, really interesting part of um, the documentary for me, and um, you know, and it, it's it's extremely complex and layered. I think that that idea, um, and you know, guys, Matthew and Barnaby, um, how I get it's a really sensitive one to to touch on, and you know, and, and there is there's chat about it being a bit culty and a bit sex like. I mean, when you were filming with these guys, and um, you know, did you did you get that impression, and and you know, how did they kind of talk to you? about the other men in their course, you know, were, were they kind of connecting? Was it all about, you know, seeking validation from the guru and vice versa? Okay, um, I, I, I think the level of devotion between the students and the instructors is quite mm -hmm. remarkable. Um, I don't know if it fits the cult-like definition in, in kind of a clinical sense, but um, yeah. I mean, I you know we would be going to um, they have they have uh, conventions they have kind of conventions uh, most most of the bigger pickup companies have conventions once or twice a year and so we would go to a convention and you'd meet a lot of students and you can see that the the way that they talk the way they behave the way they stand it, it, it's an imitation of the teacher that they are following because he he said to them look this is how a competent person stands this is how a competent person um talks this is how comp and 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 with some with some of the students they, they I, I it's very very hard to describe but there's kind of like there's a slightly glazed look about them um where you you feel like they're not it's like they're looking at you but they're kind of looking through you i i, I don't know how to explain it but it i've seen it quite a few times um and i i i, I think it's I think you shouldn't underestimate the, the, in many ways, the purpose of this documentary was, was as, as well as kind of tr raising awareness of the issue was to try and communicate with some of those people and just say, look, have you thought about this road that you are going down? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of them are not ready or willing to hear that message. And it's kind of like, oh, this is a, this is a, uh, an attack on men and yada, yada. And it's like, no, well, actually we're trying to help you. <laughs> right. I think exactly. your interest that we have at heart. I know you think we're attacking you, but we're we're just trying to we're just trying to kind of bring a few things to your attention. Mm. I get accused yeah. all the time of of being an sort of angry feminist that obviously hates men and like, my I spend my whole life only helping men. I'm a dating coach for men. I it's what I dedicate my life to. And they but they've there's an answer for everything, there's a justification for everything, and, and I think they've these pickup communities have found that the, the easiest way to deal with me is to is to lump me into that category of one of those women who doesn't know what she wants and and hates men therefore shouldn't be listened to um i mean fine i'm not saying people have to listen to me but you know it's a stretch to say that i that i don't care about men and i can only see this perspective of a woman i i think anyone who's seen the film knows that that's not what comes across so i i can i can say that um yeah pretty pretty confidently barnaby you're going to add something to yeah. uh, just to go back to the kind of the cultish side of the industry and sort of the marketing and everything else i mean the, these are groups of of people companies that have spent decades working on psychology neuro-linguistic programming um behavior and essentially what they're trying to do is distill down into a sort of uh, a quite easy to follow step by step um, actions to, to kind of an, achieve a goal. And so effectively what they do is, is they take 
each individual students and they strip away their personality, their, their empathy, um, you know, their, their kind of zest for life, and, and they effectively churn out robots um, that just follow this procedure in order to get to their goal. And I mean, personally, the sort of the undevoted uh, obedience to the leaders, the, the this is, um, you know, we are, uh, against society, we have our own little kind of uh, secret secret club, um, gives them what they feel is an excuse to, to, to carry out whichever behavior they desire and just say, we're just, you're, because you're a sheep, you're a lamb, you follow the system, mm -hmm. you don't understand, um, you know, which is, which, which is actually quite damaging to, uh, to the students. We've had a, a really good response from Australia. Um, post kind of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival, we feel that, you know, we, we, we're getting sort of a, a very good response from viewers and the press. Um, and of course, we're very grateful. I think one of the things to go back to the Julian Blanc scandal is that um, one of the contributors to the documentary came across that video online and was so kind of shocked and outraged by it, she decided to, to, to start this campaign. Now, because of that, I think it brought to light this kind of bad behavior of the pickup industry, um, which then kind of effectively is slowly forcing them to move underground. Um, and then the comment of it half promotes the industry. What we've tried to do with the documentary is to shine a light on the actual business and the business models, that mm -hmm. what you see in the videos, uh, the promotional videos is not actually a reality, that sometimes actors and escorts are hired in order to, to you know, um, give the student the, the illusion that they're succeeding in their journey. Um, and, you know, what we're hoping from, from the documentary is also to, to, to let the students question what they're purchasing. Um, and, and hopefully that will be a, a you know, a small uh, crack in, in this industry that, that will hopefully bring about some sort of change. Well, I, I, I agree. And definitely, you know, the film is going a long way to, you know, exposing that it exists for, for, for a lot of people who may not have known it in the first place, but definitely showing the, the you know, the, the, the pitfalls and the downsides of getting involved in it or being, you know, creating awareness among women about men who may approach that way. But perhaps the, the best, you know, um, nail in the coffin for this industry of all might be what we're in the middle of right now, which is coronavirus, because so much of the in, in the film, the tactics that the guys are suggesting you employ, it, get right in their face, touch them early to, you know, hands on as much as possible. Um, I, I think that, you know, sort of behavior is going to have to be dramatically changed, whether through pickup or normal social interaction. I mean, Minnie, what, what do you think is is the long-term outcome, you know, result of, of, of coronavirus in terms of people trying to chat to people. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And I hope it doesn't go too much the other way where we end up in a world where everybody's scared to speak to everybody. And, you know, I think that was one of the dangers of, of me too as well. And I was a bit worried about things going too much the other way because from my perspective, the, the vast majority of men want to do the right thing they 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 just want some help and they're not really sure where the boundaries are and, and there are lots and lots of men who are worried about being creepy but don't really know what else to do and we live in a world where the onus is still on men to make the first move a lot of the time so you know what is the solution and i th i think um it's it's a really good thing that this documentary looks at the other perspective. If you look at all, the, all of the past attempts to take down the industry, they focused on trying to take down the people leading it. They, they focused on, you know, take down Julian Blanc, take down the instructors. And I really didn't want to be a part of a documentary that did that, that was a sort of, let's shame everybody, let's point out how awful they are. Because actually we've, we've got to give the power to the women and the students. They're the ones that are capable of, of taking down the industry. The industry only exists because of the students funding it. There is no other funding other than the students' money. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna 
give power to something to take it down. It makes sense for it to be exposing it, showing it for what it is and, and, and saying to the students and the women, be careful of this, be careful you don't get sucked into these things because that will automatically take the power out of the instructors. There, there won't be instructors, there won't be pickup schools if people stop signing up to them. So I, I think this, this documentary, even though it has been criticised for giving it a platform, I think it's doing the absolute opposite actually. And I think it's the past attempts that have, that have been more, let's take it down, are the ones that have popularised it in a very, very unhelpful way. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic perspective, completely, yeah. completely agree. Yeah. Well, look, um, all three of you, Barnaby, Minnie and, and Matthew, um, you've created a documentary. Uh, Minnie, I, you know, I know you were intimately involved throughout it and, and you really do have an amazing, um, an amazing perspective and voice to it. But um, you've created a documentary that somehow manages to be um, enlightening and, um, in, you know, uh, informative of something that's quite difficult to talk about and entertaining. And so, and so, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen it, highly recommend you go and watch it. And uh, Matthew and Barnaby O'Connor and Minnie Lane, thank you so much for joining us. I've, I've really enjoyed your chat. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.